Well, we've been talking about miracles all weekend, even though this is Father's Day. I'm going to stay on the miracles theme. Um, <clears throat> I really like this message that I'm about to share with you. Um, it's been a foundational message for me, and the kind of the, the what's inside of it has has brought a lot of breakthrough for a lot of people. And um, for this morning's passage, we're going to be looking at the second book of the Kings, uh, chapter six, and we're going to start in verse eight. Once when the king of Syria was warring against Israel, he took counsel with his servants, saying, At such and such a place shall be my camp. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are going down there. And the king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God told him. Thus he used to warn him so that he saved himself there more than once or twice. In other words, it was a regular thing. And the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me who of us is for the king of Israel? In other words, who's the spy in the camp? Who's the mole that's feeding this information to the king? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, or in Hebrew, Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. And he said, go and see where he is that I may send and seize him. It was told him, behold, he is in Dothan. So he sent their horses and chariots and a great army, and they came by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, <clears throat> an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Please strike this people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, This is not the way, and this is not the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he led them to Samaria. <clears throat> as soon as they entered Samaria, Elisha said, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. As soon as the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I strike them down? Shall I strike them down? He answered, You shall not strike them down. Would you strike down those whom you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So he prepared for them a great feast, and when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master, and the Syrians did not come again on raids into the land of Israel. Well, this, uh, this message is called The Secret of Miracles. And when we read this story, we should ask ourselves, if I were there on that morning in Dothan, would I have been more like Elisha or like his servant? And I think if we're honest, most of us would say, yeah, I would have been like the servant. But you know, Lonnie Frisbee, we've mentioned him a few times this weekend. <clears throat> One time I was talking with him, we were sitting by a campfire in the Santa Cruz Mountains, in Northern California. We'd gone up there to do a, a retreat for a, a church group. Lonnie just kind of casually mentioned, he said, he had a kind of a high, thin little voice. You know, Ken, I spend, I spend about 2% uh, of my life in the spirit. And, uh, and he said, I'm looking to go to 10. Well, if Lonnie was spending 2% of his life in the spirit, and I think about the things that he did and the things that God used him to do, 
then that tells me that you know the average Christian is way below that. And uh, Lonnie actually said, the average Christian spends half a percent of the time in the spirit. So at that moment, if, the, if you follow the math, Lonnie was four times more in the spirit than the average Christian, but he wanted to boost his time in the spirit by a five-fold factor. And there was something about that that stuck with me. Obviously, it's been many years, but still I remember the conversation. And there's something about that that shows us this importance of being in the Spirit. John the Apostle talked about this. He said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And we are told that we should walk in the Spirit. And so there are these various places. I could quote some other passages, but, but the point is, most Christians don't spend enough time in the Spirit. And, of course, there's a whole conversation around, well, how do you get in the Spirit? What does that mean? What do you do, et cetera? But anyway, we should spend more time in the Spirit. And again, I'm just going to say it for, for the record. Lonnie said he was spending at that time about 2% of his time in the Spirit, which is 1 50th. So there's 168 hours in a week. So... I'm going to kind of round this off just to make the math simple. Let's say it was 150 hours. If you're spending 150 of it, that would be three hours. And so um, Lonnie was in the spirit about three hours a week, roughly, kind of. A little more, but you get the idea. But if the average Christian is at 0.5%, that means uh, something like 45 minutes a week. Uh, which if you divide that by seven, it doesn't divide easily, but it works out to something like six minutes a day or seven minutes a day. I wonder why we're so ineffective. So we want to be people of the Spirit. We want to walk after the Spirit, and we need to find out how to get in the Spirit. Now, the, the second <clears throat> book that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, the most carnal church in the New Testament, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4.18, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, for what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And this is clearly uh, what Elisha was doing on this morning in Dothan. On the one hand, he's got an army surrounding this town, and let me tell you, it's a problem when you have an army surrounding your town and they're there for you. I mean, I, they probably were given orders, right? Whether dead or alive, take this guy. And so Elisha's like, yeah, army shmarmy. And the, the servant is, bah! and Elisha says, Lord, show him what I see. And so suddenly the servant sees that actually those who were with Elisha and the servant were actually more than that army that is there. So there is something very valuable about fixing our gaze on what, is unseen. But of course, how do you fix your gaze on what is unseen? We have natural eyes, but there's an unseen world, and somehow we have to see with the eyes of faith. But there's also this language that Isaiah uses, that there are many who have eyes to see, but they do not perceive. And so this shows you how fallen we really are. We're, we're called to be people who walk by the Spirit and who live that very life that Elisha lived. How do we know that? Well, because we are told that we should follow in the footsteps of the greats in Hebrews 11. And we know that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen or not seen. That's right. So we know that this is actually a thing. The problem is we live in the Western world. When you go to other parts of the world, um, Christians can be far more in tune with the Spirit than what we typically walk in. And so this is an encouragement to all of us to kind of get on that journey, even if it's a long journey. All right, so we fix our eyes. We lock on to what is uh, unseen because what is unseen is eternal, whereas what we see is temporary. Now, because the unseen is eternal, this is... Uh, something that underlies a lot of what's in Scripture, but it, it isn't really stated explicitly. The invisible world is superior to the natural visible world. And the reason it is superior is it is eternal. That's what Paul said. 
And so whereas this current world is passing away, it may not seem like it right now, but the scriptures say that they will be burned up with fire and there will be nothing left of this earth. There will be a new earth. We don't know when that's going to happen and so forth, but the point is that's what's coming. So the natural world is temporary, passing away, and unlike the Gnostics of old, we don't believe, nor do we teach, that the natural world is illusory or that it doesn't matter. Now, there are some people who attempt to practice, let's say, healing, because they do believe that what you see is an illusion. And there was a whole heresy that arose in ancient times that taught that what we saw was an illusion, and in fact, Jesus only appeared to rise from the dead was part of what they said. And so this was one of the early heresies that the church fought. But a modern version of this is what we call Christian science, which says that all sickness is illusory. Samantha, you're nodding. You might have had a version of this in the world you used to traffic in. Yeah, maybe. Okay. So we aren't like the Gnostics, and so don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. Faith, real faith, biblical faith, is anchored in the realm of the unseen, again, because the unseen world is superior to the visible world. And so the way we access this is through this thing called faith. And we started out on the first night talking about how faith catalyzes miracles. We talked about the gift of faith, but, but right now I'm talking more about just the faith that we have in Jesus, the, the faith that saves us. So faith is evidence. It's evidence of what we hope for. And evidence is proof. You know, you think of a crime scene. What are police looking for? A hair, a piece of clothing, a drop of blood, a bullet casing, something that's evidence of what was there. But it, it lets us know we may not see it now, but, but something went on here. So faith is evidence. And I already quoted that faith is the evidence of things not seen. But to, to quote the whole passage, Hebrews 11, 1 and 2, faith is the substance of things hoped for. There's something underneath it. And you know, the Roman Catholics have actually done a lot with this when they talk about the outward uh, appearance and they talk about the substance. So when they say the words of institution over the bread and wine, they believe that the substance, the underlying ontological reality literally becomes the body and blood of Jesus. We don't tend to teach that in Protestantism, but that's what the Roman Catholics believe. But it's that underlying reality, what you don't perceive with the eye, it is nevertheless true. And so the Roman Catholics maybe are a step or two ahead of us in understanding faith in this way. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It apprehends, it perceives what we do not see, and therefore it provides evidence of things that are not seen. But the writer to the Hebrews finishes that thought with this. This is what the ancients were commended for. Now, we all want a con commendation from God, do we not? Well done, good and faithful servant. The way we're going to get that is by walking in faith, by faith, and perceiving with the eyes of faith what we might not otherwise see. We don't often talk like this in modern church, but this is really what the scripture teaches. All right, so back to Hebrews chapter 11. Um, now I've lost my place. There we go. Faith is evidence. It's evidence of what we hope for. It's perceiving something that the visible eye may not see, but in fact it is there all the same. The ancients were commended for seeing the evidence and then acting accordingly. And in fact, this is precisely what Elisha saw and did. And so God is calling us to the ancient paths. In fact, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 6, verse 16, 616, Jeremiah says, when you come to the crossroads, now this is important because Elisha was at a crossroads. Crossroads are moments of decision. When you come to a crisis point in your life, your family's falling apart. Your job's being eliminated. You've just gotten a bad diagnosis. When you come to a crisis point in life, what does Jeremiah say you, could, you should do? Not could do. You, anybody could do something. What ought you to do? 
Well, when you come to that crisis point, what you ought to do, he says, stand and consider and look in every direction. Where I live, we have one intersection that's a five-way intersection. It's not just a, you know, a T. And so you come up, and when you're there, you've got four choices of where you're going to go. And nowadays, they're building roundabouts everywhere, and some roundabouts might have five or six exits out of the roundabout when you're going around and round. So when you get to one of those kind of crossroads, you need to, you need to think about it. Which way is it I want to go? And never mind what your GPS on your phone is telling you or in your car. You need to consider. And by the way, what Jeremiah says is, stand at the crossroads and consider the ancient paths. So what does the Bible commend us to do? It commends us rather than grasping all of the shifting sands of modernity that we think back to how did the ancients please God? How did they walk? And this morning we're thinking about Elisha. How did he walk? Well, he saw what others did not see. In fact, his own servant, his own compatriot, his sidekick, his, I don't know, might have been his, it may have been Gehazi. He's not named as such. We know that at one point Elisha had a servant by that name. So it may have been a different one. Who knows? But anyway, that guy clearly wasn't living that way. God is calling us to ancient paths, to reflect on what the ancients did, and to live according to evidence perceived by faith. And that is not something we do easily. Now, humans have always struggled with it on some level. I made the joke during the weekend about Abraham and how he walked by faith uh, at least for 13 years. <laughs> and then we get Ishmael. So, but he's commended nevertheless for his faith because he got back on the horse and resumed the life of faith. So faith, true faith, it lives in the revealed will of God. It rests in the confidence that the Lord does not change cannot lie and will fulfill what he has spoken that's where faith rests and if god's will hasn't been revealed and sometimes it hasn't been sometimes it's not in scripture sometimes there is no word of knowledge no prophetic word so if god's word hasn't been revealed we can't apprehend it but we can seek it and oftentimes if we will seek it god will reveal it the scripture says, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. And so this is why we need revelation in order that what hasn't been revealed would be revealed. And similarly, if we misperceive the will of God, then our faith and along with it, our ability to overcome, to find breakthrough and victory, to soar, that will be hindered. So as an example, if we're unclear about God's will for healing, if we think he wants to, us to suffer um, in order to punish us for some misdeed or maybe to build our character, then we won't have confidence when we pray for healing. We'll pray that very famous prayer, if it be thy will, as opposed to receive the healing of the Lord or in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And we might add to this parenthetically that if people treated their children the way God is accused of treating his children, um, many of them might be arrested for child abuse. I mean, what parent would, well, I know there are people like this, but they do get arrested for child abuse. What parent would take someone, take a child's hand and place it on a hot stove to teach them a lesson? Or would break their leg in order to teach them how to walk again? I know there are those beastly people out there, but that's why we have CPS. But in general, we don't think of parents that way. We think of God as a good, good father. And so it's an appropriate point to make on Father's Day. But you know, faith develops when we truly see the heart of God, when we perceive his intentions. This is part of why Moses was a man of faith, because he said, Lord, teach me your ways that I would know them, and not only, by the way, know them up here, but that I would walk in them, that I would carry them out, that they would govern my life, and I would make choices walking in the ancient paths, now we'll say of Moses, because Moses was a man who prevailed over the things of this world. He parted oceans. He didn't close the mouths of lions, but he brought 10 plagues on Egypt, and he rescued a nation out of slavery. 
we've been talking about miracles this weekend. And we said that faith will catalyze miracles. Well, I think there are people in this room who are called to do miraculous things. They're called to do big things. Some of them will be here in Lubbock. Some of them may be well beyond Lubbock. But if you don't have an understanding, if you don't apprehend what the will of God is, if you don't see the unseen, you won't be on that list of people who do amazing things for God. Now, in contrast to faith, unbelief is anchored in what is visible or reasonable apart from God, or as we might say, if there were no God. Now, just down the road from here, there's a small university called Texas Tech. And from the name Tech, <coughs> we know it's a science-based institution. I almost went to a school called Michigan Tech until I got into a better school called Princeton. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, technology institutes and universities, by their very nature, teach what we call the scientific method. It's at the core of the Western worldview. And among the tenets of the scientific method is this tenet, that if you cannot reproduce it on demand, it isn't real, it doesn't exist. How do we know that water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius? How do we know that? Well, take some water, put it in a, could be a jug or an ice cube tray, set your freezer to 32 degrees, put it in, go away for a little while, come back, you're gonna have ice. And you can do that again and again and again and again as many times as you want, and it's always going to work, provided you're at one atmosphere of pressure. It'll change if the atmosphere changes. But, um, but anyway, that's the scientific method in a nutshell. So unbelief is anchored in what is visible or reasonable apart from God, as if there were no God. Now, the scientific method also says we have to take the minimum irreducible set of data to come to a conclusion. And in the scientific world, God is always viewed as dispensable, disposable. He's not part of the irreducible data set. Why? Because we can't prove that he exists scientifically. Just letting that sink in for a second. Because without knowing it, if you live in the United States of America or you've been educated in any kind of a Western style institution, you could have been raised in another country but if they have Western-style education, as they might in, say, I don't know, what are you, Taiwanese, mainland China? Yeah. Okay. The Chinese method of thinking is very much like this. It's highly materialistic. And, of course, China maybe once was a much more mystical, spiritual-type society. That all changed with Marxism. Marxism is a highly materialistic philosophy, just as is our Western philosophy. And in that sense... The West is no better off than communist lands. Many people don't realize that. And therefore, we are under a kind of blindness, I could even say oppression, in America, in Canada, in Western Europe, that approximates that of people who have been raised in communist countries. I've had many discussions with philosophers as well as political scientists and regular folk who live in both kinds of societies. And you'd be, re you'd be re actually quite surprised at the similarities that, that come into play for believers in both camps. Okay, so unbelief is anchored in what is visible or reasonable apart from God, as if there were no God. And consequently, it sees the natural world exactly inverted as if it were superior to the unseen world because it can do things on demand. Throw a switch, the lights go on. Put the water in the freezer, it will freeze, etc. So, unbelief is faith in the inferior, and it is rooted in a materialistic culture. That's why in my sidebar with you, I made the comment that Marxism is a materialistic philosophy. You nod pretty vigorously, both of you, because you were raised in it, you know it, um, and there would be those analogies. Now, our politics are way better here than they are in China, just to be clear. I'm talking about worldview right now. But, um, but unbelief is faith in the inferior. 
And it's rooted in materialism, which is to say that which we can see, that which we can touch, that which we can reproduce on demand. And so materialism in this case is not really the same thing as the accumulation of goods, cars, lands, houses, boats, whatever. But it might include that. Because people who are materialists, well, they don't have any belief in anything unseen or eternal or transcendent. So he who dies with the most toys wins. And that really is what drives so much of the consumerism of Western society. Whereas we had capitalism without that underpinning uh, for a long time after the emergence of the, uh, the Reformation and the beginnings of the Enlightenment. But anyway, I don't want to turn this into a philosophy lecture, so let's just stay with the sermon. So materialism is faith in the natural as the superior reality. And in a sensual society, a society that lives to please the eye, maybe nice smells, the nose, or pleasant sounds, and you know, got to have music all the time with our Beats by Dre headsets and so forth. Um, you know, what, what we can put on our palate. I, I think of the many preachers I know who boast about the fact that they call themselves foodies. And I think, well, foodie is just a modern name for glutton. Um, but, I mean, we have to eat, and I'd rather, at the margin, I'd rather eat good food than bad food. But I am not on a riotous pursuit of the next amazing meal. So, <clears throat> in a sensual society, we're trained to believe only in what we can measure and perceive through our five senses because a sensual society exists to serve the senses. Now, what's the highest expression of this that, that we have? Our riotous pursuit of sexual pleasure in the modern world. I could say a lot more about that, but we are in a mixed crowd. There are children in the room, and it's Sunday morning, and we've got to end the sermon sometimes. So, again, I'll just let that sit out there. But, but for sure, the, the hypersexualized society we live in is, in fact, an indicator of the materialistic world in which we live. And so, in other words, in a sensual society, we believe only in what we can measure and reproduce on demand. Real faith doesn't deny the natural realm, a tumor is still of tumor. People of faith are realists, but faith sees a reality greater than the tumor. That reality is God's power. Right there. That's really the deal. Yeah, real faith doesn't deny the natural realm. Someone with a tumor has a tumor. We're not Christian scientists who say, oh, that tumor is illusory. It's actually there. You can see it, you can touch it, you can be a materialist about it. Yep, we got it. We, we can do a CAT scan, we can see it inside the body. It's real. We're not denying that it's real. People of faith are called to be realists. They are called to deal with what is there. But faith, in the biblical sense, sees a reality even greater than the tumor. It's called God's power. And with that, we can expect that God might dematerialize the tumor. I've seen that happen on multiple occasions. We might say there's ALS in the body, but, but by the strength of God, you, you had it for a year and you're, you're sitting upright, you can talk, you're, it's amazing. And, you know, we're looking forward to September 8 if it doesn't happen this morning, right? So we know there's a, there's a reality beyond the reality we're perceiving with our natural eyes or touching with our hands or smelling with our nose or tasting with our tongue. I left one out, the ears what we hear with our ears. So this is actually something that, uh, that when you think about it, you may have encountered somewhere along the way before, but you've probably never thought about it as a spiritual truth. So how many people in this room, probably more men than women, but there might be some women as well, how many people in this room are hunters or fishermen? Okay, so you're used to spotting animals in the wild that others might not even see. In fact, sometimes you don't see them, and as you stare, you go, wait a minute, twigs don't usually go that way. Is that an antler? And you look through your binoculars, and whoop, that's a good buck right there. Or I remember one time I was actually fishing with Joni's husband. We, I was visiting in Utah, and he, liked, he was a fly fisherman. And so he said, hey, let's go for a hike up to this lake, and let's go catch some fish. And so on the hike up to the lake, we're following a little stream that was coming down out of that lake. It wasn't very wide. It was about like so. We're walking alongside of it, 
And her husband was quite a, quite a fly fisherman. I'm more of a hunter than a fisherman. I like to fish, but it, I'm, he was, I was out of my league with him. So we're, we're climbing up to this lake along this little stream bed, and he's in front of me. His name was Bill. He died during COVID, but not of COVID. And uh, he, he does like this. And so I know what that means. I, I stop. And he turns around to me very quietly. and he goes, you see that fish right there? I said, I don't see anything. <laughs> he says, look right there where the water's coming down and it drops over the rock and there's a little bit of a riffle. Okay. He says, throw your line there I threw my line right there it drops right there boom that fish hit the line I didn't even see the fish was it there yes it was an unseen reality to me my eye did not perceive even though it saw yeah it's the same way with hunting here's another one Bernoulli's theorem I'm sure you all woke up this morning thinking about Bernoulli's theorem but I think about it sometimes because I fly a lot. What is Bernoulli's theorem? Well, it's a, it's a theorem. It's a proven thing. And engineers know it. Any, any engineers here? Mechanical or aerospace engineers? There's one. You know Bernoulli's theorem. Okay, Bernoulli's theorem says that if you take a gas, meaning air, and you accelerate it to a certain speed, at some point, depending on the density of the air, which is a function of its temperature and the humidity in it, but at some point, and they have charts that let you, you know, graph where this will happen, it stops behaving like a compressible gas and it behaves like a non-compressible fluid. And this is the principle by which airplanes operate. And so when you accelerate an airplane down a runway, you hit what's called takeoff speed and you get enough lift under the wings pushing up because the airflow over the top of the wing and under the bottom, the wing literally splits the airflow. And because it's covering more territory over the top, the pressure drops. You've got a low pressure zone above the wing and a high pressure zone under the wing. High pressure zone pushes up and because it's pushing into a low pressure zone, the entire plane is lifted off the ground but if you drop below that speed, that speed is called stall speed. Doesn't need much explanation. A plane that's flying will literally fall out of the air if it goes too slowly because Bernoulli's theorem stops working. Is that a pretty good layman's explanation? All right. So, a lot of times when I'm flying, I like to get the seat right there by the leading edge of the wing. And especially if you're flying like in, in and out of, say, San Francisco or Los Angeles or uh, Melbourne, Australia or uh, New York, all of these are by bodies of water, and so there tends to be more humidity in the air. And when you hit that speed of takeoff or landing, a lot of times you will see something white about this thick, milky white, but it is unmistakable to the naked eye and you see it go right over the top of the wing. You are literally witnessing the unseen reality of Bernoulli's theorem and why that airplane is not crashing, even though it might weigh 100 tons or more. Bernoulli's theorem is an example of an unseen reality that is a higher thing even than the law of gravity, but it only works under certain conditions. And here's another one. How many here have heard of the Hubble Space Telescope or the James Webb Space Telescope? Okay, well, there's a lot of things out there that your eye can't perceive, right? Stars, galaxies, quasars, all this stuff. It's all there, but you can't see it. But these telescopes tell us that these things are there. And not only that, in the realm of light, now, you know, we're looking at light here. It appears white to the eye. Well, those may be a little less, so they have a kind of a light blue cast, but... But we have light in this room. But, you know, electromagnetic radiation isn't just what the eye can pick up. It, it, if, it's, if it's below red, we call it infrared, but you can perceive it because now it's warm, it's heat. And above violet, at the high end of the visible spectrum, we have what's called ultraviolet light. And when they designed the James Webb Space Telescope, they particularly designed it to pick up infrared, but there are also some ultraviolet sensing on it and the Hubble. 
So what does this mean? Well, there are things that we could literally call them light, but they're not visible light. They are electromagnetic radiation, and visible light is just kind of one zone. So if we took the length of this pulpit here, and we wanted to say, what is the visible light spectrum? Approximately, this is approximate, but about that much of it would be visible, and right here on the spectrum is where it would be. All of this would be below the visible spectrum, and somewhere down here is the infrared part, and it, it, there are other things they divide it into. And then up here, you get ultraviolet light, and ultimately you get X-rays and cosmic rays and other things. So what we see is only that much, but there's so much more out there. Now, I'm telling you these things not because I'm trying to impress you with my knowledge of science and astronomy, but because I'm trying to give you an illustration of the fact that you already understand this concept, but you may have never thought about it this way. Now, let's talk about this. Everybody in this room has one of these somewhere within reach. Hopefully, it's silenced. Um, if you wanted to, you could drive to Chicago just by putting in an address, and it would take you there. This operates on something you can't see, you can't hear it, you can't smell it. It's called electromagnetic radiation. It's not in the visible spectrum. If the phone should ring, mine's in flight mode, so it won't, but if it should ring, you could answer that phone and talk to someone. This phone can take you places, it can allow you to communicate, and everything it does is based on the unseen realm. And you trust your life to it sometimes to get to your destination or to call 911 maybe. Do you not? Yeah. So what I'm suggesting to you is that you want to operate in the realm of the unseen and you're already doing it, and therefore what I am suggesting to you is not unreasonable. You just haven't thought about it in terms of the realm of the spirit. You're just used to thinking about it like, how do I find my way to the store to buy milk? All right, back to this idea of belief and unbelief. Those who are filled with unbelief, they like to call themselves realists. This is what they call themselves. And you go down to Texas Tech, they'll say, well, I'm just being realistic. So it's a very common term that's in play. And of course, the inverse of that is, if you don't play by our rules, then you're not a realist, you're unrealistic. You're naive, you're foolish, you're blah, 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 blah. So they find a way of shaming us out of the very inheritance that we should have, which is to live in the realm of the unseen. So that's fine, we'll, we'll seed the point. They can call themselves realists. I'm suggesting God is calling us to be super realists or hyper realists, if you like that, because we are called to live beyond the scene. And yes, we take account of it. That's why we are realists, but we're living even beyond that. Or maybe we could flip it on its head and we could say that we are actually the realists and unbelief constrains one into being a sub-realist. You are living below the full potentiality of who you are as a human and as a Christian. I don't want to live below what all God has made me capable of doing and being. You might want to, but I don't. And I'm encouraging you to join me on the journey. That's what I've been doing this entire weekend in the messages that we've been uh, sharing. So a third subsidiary scripture. I've already given you two. The first was 2 Corinthians 4.18, fixing our eyes not on what is seen but on the unseen. The second was Hebrews 11, 1 and 2, faith is the substance of things hoped for and evidence of things not seen. Here's the third one, Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Since then you have been raised with Christ. How many people here have been raised with Christ? Okay, I got the right crowd. Anyone who's not a Christian, you can come over and join us. Um, we'll lead you to the Lord at the end of the service. But since then, you've been raised with Christ. Here's what we are commanded to do by the Apostle Paul. This is not a good idea. This is a direct instruction that you are to take on board. And it's going to catapult you into the realm of the unseen. Here's what you do. Here's what Paul said. Set your hearts on things above. Now, what is the heart? It's the seat of affections. 
It's what drives you. It's what motivates you. So for some people, football is the seat of their affections. For some people, it might be, I don't know, basketball or hunting or fishing. Or for women, I don't know, knitting, grandchildren. I'm not sure, but I'm not trying to be a sexist. I'm just throwing out ideas. What are the things that we set our affections on? The scripture says we should set our affections, our hearts, the things that capture us and make us passionate, we should set those on things above where Christ is. I remember a song we used to sing in my grandparents' church. The Methodists in this room will recognize this song. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story. There's my affection. It will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. We were singing about this when I was a boy, but we weren't living it. Oh, no, no. God's not doing that anymore. No, no, it all went away with the apostles. Okay. The other thing we have to do, not just set our hearts on things above, but we set our minds on things above. That means you focus your attention, but we're looking upward. Now, you know, there's a saying that people use. They say, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. Well, en contraire, I think people who are heavenly minded are actually doing some earthly good because they tend to be the people who shift nations, found orphanages like George Muller, or work miracles. And the people who live with their mind down here on the earthly plane, they do some good maybe through scientific discoveries and breakthrough, but right now we're talking about the world of the supernatural, not science. And I don't think, I don't think by the way, that you can't be a scientist if you're a spirit-filled Christian who lives by these principles, but you might find yourself at times in a bit of uh, conflict with your colleagues. Okay, so... Those filled with unbelief, they call themselves realists. We're called to be super realists. So what we do, as Paul commanded, is as an act of our will. Now, the will is the third part of the human soul. The will is the third part of the human soul. And the will is what guides our actions. It's what guides our intentions. It guides our planning. Yesterday, my wife messaged me. I was getting ready to come in here to preach. And she sent a picture. She said, I, I took the car in for service. And while I was here waiting for it, I started walking around the showroom, and they were having a sale on a 2024 car. <laughs> you know where this is going. <laughs> but see, her will was already engaged. So she said, you know, do you mind? And I'm like, well, it looks pretty good. Does it have this and this? Yeah, it's got way more than the car that we currently have. I'm like, all right, well, if, if you love it, I mean, it looked okay to me. Usually you think of a husband and wife looking at a car together, but I'm here preaching, and she's back in Los Angeles. So anyway, maybe 10 minutes later, I, I wrote back, and I said, so what are you going to do? She said, I already bought it. <laughs> got it. But there's your will, right? She envisioned life with this new car. Her affection was set on, I don't know, new car smell, bigger moonroof, I'm not sure. But anyway, by the way, it's only a Honda Pilot. But okay, so she, uh, she got the car. But the soul has three parts to it. It has the will by which we direct what we do. I'm walking towards you because I'm choosing to do it. My will is telling me, get closer here. The second part of the will is your emotions. Those are your affections, that which you motivates you and gets you excited. And the third part of it is your mind, that which you dwell on, that which you think about. And so when we think about these three parts of the will, all of them are in Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Part 1, as an act of your will, Paul doesn't say it, but he says, set your affections, set your hearts, and set your mind. So he's telling you, use your will to direct your affections. Use your will to direct your thinking. Make a choice. Really important point. Don't just wait for it to hit you. Go chase it down. 
All right, so as an act of our will, we are to fix our affections, our emotions, and our intellect on things above. And when we do that, what we are doing is we are taking our broken souls that are kind of scattered into pieces, and we are fusing them together into one integrated whole once again. This is the way that mankind was created by God to live. And when we talk about human brokenness, a lot of it emerges from this fracturing of the soul. So now we're talking kind of what's some of the value of inner healing. It might help you integrate and unify your will, your mind, and your emotions once again in such a way that suddenly you become an integrated person and you become a force for change. So Smith Wigglesworth is a man who probably doesn't need introduction in this house, but he was a powerful healing evangelist. He lived in the early 20th century. When these three are united, our soul is unified, we become a force for faith. Smith Wigglesworth once said, I am not moved by what I see. Oh, that's interesting, right there. I am not moved by what I see. I'm living beyond the perceived world that is natural. He says, but I am moved by what I believe. And so with that, he would say, if I walk into a room and the Holy Spirit is not moving, I move the Holy Spirit. Now that could sound really arrogant, and I don't know that Smith Wigglesworth was the most articulate man who ever lived, but I think what he was trying to say was, if I'm in a room that's filled with people who are no faith, have no confidence, nothing's happening, it's just kind of flat, I walk in and I perceive that there is an unseen realm, that God does want to heal, that there are miracles to be secured. And with that, I start speaking into that. I start doing that as an act of will because my affections and my thoughts are in heaven and on that world of the unseen. And suddenly, miracles break out. That's what Smith Wigglesworth was known for. He literally could move a room. You could too. You may have never thought about that. You may have never tried it. By the way, don't make your first time out from a stage. Do it in a small group or something like that. Practice a little bit. Get used to living this way because this is not your normal. It could be your normal. I'm encouraging it to be your normal, but it is not your normal this morning, probably. And as a result, you do need to grow in this. So fear of appearing to live in denial or in what we call unreality keeps many people from a life of faith and they settle for unbelief. And this is where many people live and die. They live in fear. They live in uncertainty. They don't have any confidence that God will be with them. And God doesn't want us to be overcome by all that. He wants us to overcome evil with good. So that fear of appearing to live in denial lets people settle. And when I, I really do mean, you know, we say, well, I settled for this. It means I came short of what I really wanted. And so people spend their lives here. Now, fear of man, which is that fear of appearing to live in denial in this moment anyway, fear of man is strongly associated with unbelief in the Bible. When we fear men, we don't fear the Lord. We therefore don't live in the realm of the unseen. Whereas the fear of God is associated with faith, and this is what the ancients were commended for. So God is calling us to live a life of faith where the unseen becomes more real to us than the seen. And when we reach this place, we will break through into the, into the realm of miracles, and it will become our normal. Now, in closing, let me give you this example. A few years back, I had a roommate named Dave. Dave had gone to school in Georgia, and then he joined the U.S. Army, served in Iraq one. Um, but Dave was, uh, he was on the amateur pro tour with golf when, uh, when I, was right before I met him, he finally left that behind and was trying to develop his own life. Anyway, um, so he was, he was an amazing golfer, and he was a machine. Sometimes he'd say to me, we were both unmarried at the time, he'd say, hey, let's go down to the driving range and hit a bucket of balls. And I'd be like, I'm going to look like a fool, and you're going to look like a machine. But Dave was a kind soul, and he wanted to help me get better. And so we'd go down there, and you know, he would just tee up the ball, and you know, he had a particular way of doing it. Now, I, there's probably some golfers in this room. You may not agree with what I'm about to say. It's okay if you don't. I'm telling you what Dave said. And Dave was on the amateur pro tour, so he was just about to you know, be up there with Arnold Palmer and Tiger Woods. 
But anyway, he said, if you're a right-handed golfer, you take your, the club in your left hand, you put your thumb down the, at the, on the rubber there, you wrap your fingers around the shaft. That part's not controversial. You link this pinky with this index finger, and now you wrap like this. Now, you put the ball on the tee lined up with your left toe. I know some people put it here in the middle, but that's not what Dave said. I'm telling you Dave's way, okay? All right, so you do this, and then you, know, you, you lock this arm. This arm never bends. You lock this arm. Again, you may have been taught differently. I don't know. I can't speak to that. I'm telling you what Dave said. Keep your eye on the ball. When you swing back, keep that eye on the ball. Now, see that my arm's starting to bend. So what you really want to do is lock it and bend at the wrist. And then you come back through the hips, but don't take your eye off that ball. You can swing this arm. This one can bend, but not this left one. No. Okay. You're watching the ball, and when you come through, you've got all the force of your hips. And you see, if you're, if you're lined up and this arm is locked, you will always address the ball squarely. I never saw Dave hit a slice. He'd hit that ball 500 yards. If he wanted it to come a little short, he'd just swing his hips a little less, 400 yards, 300 yards. And I saw him multiple times when we'd go out and play golf. He'd just look at a, at a hole and, yeah, okay, got sand trap over there, got the water right. And the ball would land like this far from the cup. Sometimes right into the cup. How do you do that? This is Dave's method. It's the secret of miracles. <laughs> Had to say it. All right. So here's Ken doing Dave's method. And it would, you know, <laughs> or meow. You know, no, 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 you don't do it that way. So he, he would show me again and again. After a while, I got to where at least I could consistently hit a 300 or a 350, and I didn't slice too much. But I wasn't Dave. I wasn't as good as Dave. I hadn't been doing as long as Dave. So what I'm telling you, this idea of unifying the soul, will, affections, and mind, this is a simple concept. I've shown you where it's rooted in Scripture. But if you're not used to living this way, it can be difficult to execute just like Dave's method of hitting a golf ball. Like I say, I got better with time, and you will too. Start practicing this, practicing this. Make it your normal. Pay attention to where your affections are going during the day. Pay attention to where your mind is going during the day. Especially pay attention to it when you're praying for people or you're praying for a situation that needs a turnaround or a breakthrough. Pay attention to it. Because if you think back now on what Elisha was doing in Dothan, where was his affection? God, he was a prophet of the Lord. What was he thinking about? <laughs> Army schmarmy. <laughs> yeah, 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 I see all that stuff, and I'm looking even beyond that, and I see beyond the army to the fiery chariots and horsemen that are here with me, and that's what I choose to believe. And with that, he, com he comes out. Did you catch that in the story? He goes, ah, this isn't the city, and this isn't the way. Follow me. I'll take you to where you want to go. What kind of a guy faces down an army on his own with no weapons except a guy who sees that unseen realm? And that's what we're called to do. And if we put this into play and we get reasonably good at it, I believe we're going to turn this country around. I believe we're going to see a great revival. I believe we're going to close the mouths of lions, and I believe that widows will receive their dead back to life. Amen and amen. Go thou and do likewise.